All right, all right. Um, let's let's try this out. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, it's Nate here. Um, if uh, if you're kind of tuning in, uh, you know, after the fact uh, or after the live stream here, uh, welcome. Uh, you can bear with me a little bit uh, because this is live. I have no idea how this is all going to work out, or if anyone is even going to see this. Um, so. We'll wait a minute for some people to, to hopefully show up. That will make this a little bit more interesting. In the meantime, uh, this is going to be kind of the rough outline for the live stream today. Um, and I think this is going to be the, the rough outline for uh, the live streams that I want to do going forward. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute here. But uh, the, the general form here is going to be uh, a community question. Um, something that I've gotten, you know, from social media or talking with other people. Uh, then we'll give a little update uh, on what's new. Maybe that's what's new with uh, things I've been working on or found interesting in the, the Android community, the Kotlin community, software development in general. Um, just hopefully some interesting tips and info there for everybody. Then we're going to go back to another community question because, you know, I think that's a really interesting and useful way uh, to structure these things. Then we're going to do, hopefully, a chat Q&A. This is certainly dependent on whether or not people are here. Um, if you are watching this after the fact and you have a question, please leave it in the comments down below. I will get back to it. I'll either answer it there or answer it in a future live stream or honestly, most likely, both. Uh, and then the last one here is a question of the week, uh, something for us to just think about, hopefully prompt some discussion here amongst everybody. And so yeah, so that's really kind of the structure that this is going to take. So um, obviously here, if you're watching this or after the fact, uh, I'm doing a live stream, which is something I haven't really done regularly. However, a few weeks ago, I did put out a video talking about how for 2020, one of my goals really was to try and do some more live streaming. Um, now, why do I want to do some live streaming? Uh, mostly because I really want to try and grow kind of the sense of community here. And I think for me personally, I just really enjoy the more one-on-one -on -one time with people. I really like getting to sit down, uh, chat with people, you know, answer questions, talk back and forth. Um, and I think a live stream is a little bit more of a personal way to try and replicate that uh, online here on YouTube. So that's my goal here. It's just a, a time for us to sit down, chat, um, ideally have a, a cup of coffee or some other kind of drink. Uh, I missed out on mine because this was kind of last minute. Um, but I realized that today is already January 31st and, you know, one of my goals for the year was to live stream and I didn't want to go the entire first month of the year without live streaming. So it suddenly dawned on me, hey, it's Friday night. I'm done with work. The house is more or less empty for the moment, except for the dogs, which are being oddly quiet right now. So I thought I would jump on here and try and knock out uh, this first real live stream of 2020. So, uh, you know, a couple things here. I, I am traveling this week, so, you know, I might be able to tell this is not my normal backdrop when I'm recording. Um, and I don't know how the, the audio is going to go uh, with all this. I don't know if the dogs are going to be quiet. So just bear with me, <laughs> please. Um, hopefully we can make this more of a regular thing. I'll get better at it um, and we'll have more of a regular cadence here. Um, and hopefully it'll just improve as it goes on. Things tend to do that. So uh, with that said, I think we'll go ahead and kind of jump in here. So like I mentioned, uh, the first thing I wanna do here is take a look at a question that I got from the community. And in particular, I got this one on Instagram, you know, a week ago, 10 days ago, something like that. Uh, so the idea with this question is, how do you modularize three Android apps that are all using the same copied code? Now, to give some more context around this question, um, basically this person came to me and said they have three apps. They're all essentially the exact same thing with just like a few tweaks here and there. And the challenge they've run into is now when they want to fix a bug, they have to fix it in each of the individual apps. And so what they want to do is try and consolidate this code somehow um, and kind of pull out 
a, a module, a separate repo, something to contain that common code so that they can fix it in one spot. Um, and this is actually a pretty interesting challenge because it takes the, the normal idea of modularization and you know makes it a little bit more complex because you're dealing with multiple code bases. Um, and so I just want to point out a couple things uh, along these lines here for us to consider. Let me check my notes here one more time. Yeah, there we go. I couldn't remember if I had these in here. So um, to start off, uh, if you're not familiar with the idea of modularization, I'll just talk about that briefly. So when we say modularize our app, we mean kind of break that apart into separate uh, Gradle modules, um, or really you could also think about it as separate repos potentially um, as well. But essentially pulling out bits of code and common functionality um, and treating those essentially as, as libraries or dependencies of your core app module. So within an Android project, you know, that's being built with Gradle, you can structure your code so that you have, you know, multiple modules. These can be very small, fine-grained things, or they could be higher level things like features. So you might have a module for your authentication screen, excuse me, uh, you might have a module for um, you know, user details. You might have a module at a lower level that is essentially common code shared amongst the rest. And that idea of a common shared module that lives kind of at a, at a lower level um, below your application code, that is what this person was getting at here. So, oh, I see, I see a thumbs up in the comments. Uh, so that must mean that at least somebody's here. That's awesome. Thank you for the thumbs up. Uh, if you are tuning in, leave, leave me a comment or a thumbs up or something. Let me know you're here. Let me know where you're watching from. I'm curious just to see what everybody is up to since it is Friday night here uh, on the West Coast of the United States. I know it's maybe Saturday morning or the middle of the night, other places. So I'm just curious what people are up to. Um, so if we go back to here, our modularization. Um, so we're working towards having some common module uh, for all three of these apps so that they can reuse and fix these bugs. Um, the next thing that I think it's worth pointing out here is when you think about modularization, um, that's kind of a trendy word in Android today, uh, but you should really ask yourself, is modularization worth it? If you're working in a project that is essentially a single mono repo where all of your code is just in kind of one directory within the project, which is pretty much the common thing. If you start a new Android Studio project, that's what you get by default. Um, you need to really ask if modularization is going to be worth it. And honestly, for a lot of projects, it's probably not going to be worth it. Unless this is something you're really planning to support long term, it's going to be a real uh, production app. Or if you're really wanting to build a sample project specifically to understand modularization, um, if it's not kind of in those scenarios, it might not give you that many benefits. Um, the benefits that it can give you, however, is potentially a better build speeds, um, improved uh, because of things like Gradle incremental compilation um, and build caching and things like that. Um, and those all definitely can work, but they do require you to have your dependencies set up correctly. If you're using things like annotation processors, those have to be configured properly. So modularization is a good thing. Oh, thank you, uh, Noor. Thank you, I see the thumbs up there. That's awesome, glad to have you here. Um, so like I said, modularization can be really good, but it doesn't come for free and you have to make sure you know what you're doing. So unless you're really sure you need to modularize, excuse me, modularize, uh, you might wanna think about holding off. Now in this case, back to the original question of modularizing these three apps. In this case, it does make sense to me, at least if we're starting really small, because they're effectively the same project. So pulling out common code should be relatively straightforward. Hey, Marcos, glad to have you here. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, so my suggestion to this person, um, and I think I, you know, I still stand by this, is what you could do here is try and maybe pull out a small, uh, small set of common functionality. So this could be even just starting with like a single helper method or some, some model classes that are used in all these applications. Um, effectively, you can create a, a new uh, library module and we're gonna store this in a separate repo. So if you have your three repos somewhere within GitHub, most likely, um, you might have repo one, two, and three for the three different apps. We're now gonna have repo four over here that's going to be our common module. 
Now within that module, we're gonna pull over that code. So let's say we have a, a user class and that user class is a simple data class um, and it's being used in all the applications. So we pull that over into the common module that's going to live in this new GitHub repository. We now want to update, oops, hopefully you can't hear that, the dogs are roaming around, sorry about that. Uh, we now wanna update the three applications to basically pull in this common module. So what we can do is essentially reclone this new uh, common module repo uh, into our existing applications and essentially treat them as a, as a library. So we can update our settings.gradle to uh, pull in this new common module as a dependency of our project. We can then remove the old implementation of the user class from each of the applications because now it's duplicated. So now what we've done is essentially just pulled it out of the application modules and the application repos, pulled it over here into this common repo, and then added it back into our projects as a dependency. And so now once you've done this, functionally it shouldn't really change anything. You'd likely just have to update your Gradle files and maybe some import statements within your code, wherever you're using that user class. Once you've done this though, once you have this structure in place, you can start pulling more and more stuff over into this common module in the other repo. And as you do that, you can start to see where you have really inter, uh, interconnected dependencies, break those apart as needed, and again, slowly and surely maybe pull things over into this common repo. And so what you're doing is every time you pull something out from the three individual apps that's shared, you consolidate it into one place, making it easier to test, making it easier to understand where to fix code, um, and it also makes it so you don't have to duplicate those efforts. And so, you know, going back to kind of the outline here, ultimately what you want to do is avoid having to duplicate all the code here and especially duplicating bug fixes in this situation. So if you have, you know, multiple apps that are all using kind of these common set of components that you're just copy and pasting, uh, this type of approach where you are maybe pulling that out into some you know, external library that lives separately, that could be a really nice way to go about this um, for you all. So that uh, that's kind of I, all I have to say on that one. I thought that was an interesting question. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, I, I would like to maybe try and do a sample project around this sometimes, because I do think it actually would be an interesting exercise to go through that and walk through that in a tutorial and kind of show, um, you know, how you might do that. So next up, I want to jump into, whoop, there we go. So I'm still getting used to the software I'm using for the live streaming here. Uh, but the next section I want to jump into is uh, just kind of what's, what's new. And so for me, uh, because this is kind of the first one we're doing and this whole live stream thing is new in general, um, you know, I wanted to share thoughts of what kind of I'm looking towards for 2020, uh, specifically around this channel. And so, like I really mentioned, um, earlier, I really want to focus on more community engagement, more kind of one-on-one -on -one direct human communication, uh, like, you know, live streams like this, you know, more question and answer stuff, really want to be able to help meet you all where you are, answer your questions, help you solve the problems. Um, and ultimately, I want to try and have more emphasis on not just teaching one-off tutorials, but really trying to help you develop the skills needed to grow in your career. And so that definitely includes technical things like Android and Kotlin, uh, but that also includes things like how to work in a team, what to expect in your first job, you know, maybe how to work remotely, how to improve your kind of your portfolio and your online presence when you're looking for a job, um, all the other things that kind of go into building a career as a software developer and really specifically as like a mobile developer because that is what my uh, primary experience is in. So that's kind of what I'm looking towards in, in 2020, uh, kind of diversifying a little bit what we're talking about here, but also in a way focusing in on the idea of kind of career and job readiness prep. Now, in other updates on, on my end, oops, bumped the table there. Uh, I was uh, very excited to get accepted into Chicago Roboto uh, this year. And if you're not familiar, uh, Chicago Roboto, it's in Chicago, really great, small, kind of independent Android conference. 
And as I'm scrolling through the speaker lineup, you know, you can see me there in the bottom left, but there's a really great lineup of speakers here. And, you know, if you're looking for a conference to go to um, and you can afford to get to Chicago from wherever you are, uh, I really highly recommend it. This is kind of one of the, the few conferences I'm planning on going to this year. Um, they do a really good job. Um, and also, if you're if you're curious more about them, you can go back here up in the uh, the about section, and you can explore what uh, what the agendas and everything have looked like for the past couple of years. Um, this will be my third year speaking here, and I'm pretty excited about uh, getting to go back. Um, so yeah, so I'm excited to be sharing. Uh, my talk will be on building an Android CI pipeline with GitHub Actions. So if that's something that you're curious about. Uh, stay tuned. I'll be adding some more kind of GitHub Actions uh, tutorials probably in March leading up to the talk. And then we'll probably do a live stream of my talk prep uh, sometime in early April, right before I give the talk. So looking forward to that. And hopefully, you know, I can help some of you out uh, learning about GitHub Actions. Now, kind of the next thing that uh, I just want to chat about in this realm of updates real quick is... Um, you know, server-side Kotlin. Uh, if you kind of been following me and my content the last week or so, you know, I wrote a blog post um, and also I put out one YouTube video already specifically related to server-side Kotlin and KTOR. And yesterday I finished filming and editing a video that's kind of almost like a part zero to that. Um, but essentially it's a companion to this article. And so this article was really a, a an overview of what is out there to get started with server side Kotlin. So you see here, I start off with just, you know, how to start with server Kotlin. I have some links to some resources there, but the really interesting part I want to point out, just in case you missed this was, you know, I talk about four different frameworks that you can use for writing server side Kotlin. Um, so the first one here is KTOR. Uh, this is, you know, a, a really nice option for server side Kotlin. Uh, because it's Kotlin first, it takes advantage of all the common Kotlin features like DSLs, Lambdas, and everything. Um, and there's some great resources out there, and that's what I'm particularly looking at now. And we'll be hopefully adding more tutorials on how to really build, you know, simple backends using KTOR and Kotlin. Um, but also, you know, I give a little bit of talk here on Spring Boot, uh, which is popular kind of JVM-based uh, web framework that has support for Kotlin as well. Uh, you can see. You know, kind of the, the website here, you know, they have a lot of resources, particularly if you go into the guides section, um, they have a lot of different tutorials here, as you can see. So if you're interested in, you know, Spring Boot and Spring Boot with Kotlin specifically, that is a great option. Another one here is HTTP 4K. This one's new to me, but actually looks pretty interesting. Um, if we go to their repo here, scroll down to the bottom, you know, they describe themselves as a lightweight but fully featured uh, toolkit for HTTP requests. Um, and it's really interesting here because you see they, they essentially kind of are able to structure this as very simple functions. And so they really push you know, immutability, kind of functional aspects, um, and performance. So that's a really nice option there as well. And then the last one is uh, Quarkus, which is probably a more intense approach. Um, this one describes itself as being a Kubernetes uh, native Java stack um, tailored to the, you know, the JVM, uh, but they also support Kotlin now as kind of an experimental feature. And so, you know, we probably don't need to jump right into to microservices if you're getting started with server side uh, development, whether it's Java, Kotlin, or anything else. But if that's kind of where you're heading or looking, uh, Quarkus could be a good bet. Um, I had it recommended to me by a few people. And that's really kind of it for this article. You know, if you wanna wanna learn more, you know, go to my website, gubar.io, check out this blog post. And also next Tuesday, look out for the new tools and tips video where I'll be talking more specifically about uh, these four frameworks in general. Oh, okay, so now we wanna go back and we'll just jump right into the next uh, community question. Um, and this one was really more about kind of remote work. Uh, and actually, I was I was surprised. I did a poll on Instagram yesterday or day before, um, just asking people, you know, how many people were working remotely? How many people were, you know, would like to work remotely? And how many people would like to learn more about remote work? And I was surprised to see that 
about you know 40% of the respondents were already working remotely, which honestly was a pretty big surprise to me. Um, also, I was surprised that uh, I think it was like 99% of people said they would like to work remotely, which that's not really that big a surprise. But then also uh, like 75% of people said they would be interested in learning more about remote work, even though they're not working remotely. So um, I think that could be kind of fun. Um, I've been working remotely for, I think, over three years now. So I've learned a few things on how, how to work remotely, how to be effective in that environment, and ways to make it fun, to, to not go crazy in isolation, how to stay focused, all that stuff. So that's something that I will be talking about more. However, for this specific question, this person was really wanted to know, how do you balance working at home, but then also living out of your home? You know, how do you manage that when you're kind of in the same place all the time? Hey, newbie coats, thanks for joining. Uh, Nepal, that is a long ways away from here. Thank you for uh, for tuning in. How's it going over there tonight? What? Actually, I'm curious. What what time of day is it there in Nepal? Um, it's got to be middle of the morning somewhere. Interesting. Uh, yeah, leave a comment down below. I'd love to, to hear about that. Um, anyways, so yeah, back to, to working and living out of the same place. So a couple of the tips that I shared with this person, and I'll show you here again now. So the first thing that I think is really important when you are working from home and obviously living from home is to just try and set some clear boundaries and structure around your day. Um, and this is a this comes into play in a few areas. So one, physical kind of structures, physical boundaries. So if you can, if you can have a separate office, a separate place in your house or your apartment or whatever, where you sit down to work and that is a little bit removed from the rest of the living space, I think that is really important. 8 a.m. in the morning. All right. Thank you for tuning in. Um, so if you can walk into your office in the morning and say, okay, I'm in the office. This is the place where I do my work do your work and then finish up and leave the office, that can really help you get into the right mindset to be productive during your day without it bleeding too much into the rest of your life. Um, and conversely from this, I think it's important to not do too much work in your common spaces. So very specifically, um, I don't think it's a good idea to work in your bedroom if you can avoid it. And especially not like actually in bed. Uh, a lot of people, when they think of remote work, they have this mental image of people laying in their pajamas all day, uh, sitting in bed on their laptop doing their work. And while you can do that, I don't think that's a productive way. I have tried it. I never get a lot of work done that way. Um, so if you can, you know, try and not work from your bedroom if possible. You know, similarly, you know, maybe working from your couch might not be the best thing because it's very easy to start blending the lines between work and the rest of your life. And you want to separate those smoothly. Another, I think, really important thing when you are, you know, working from home most of the time is to try and have a structure to your day. Try and have a schedule. So if you can wake up at a certain time every day, uh, you know, get ready, go through your routine and know, okay, at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. or 7 a.m., whatever, that is when I really switch into work mode. That is really important, again, because it helps you maintain those boundaries of work and the rest of your life. And the reason I'm pushing so much on boundaries here is because what you can easily fall into is this situation where because you're home, you just start to work kind of all the time. Uh, you know, maybe 5 a.m. or excuse me, maybe 5 p.m. rolls around and you're still working on a problem and so you don't put it down, but maybe you go and sit on the couch and you keep working. Uh, and what happens is you start to not be present for your family or you start to not be present and available for friends or your pets or just whatever else that you could be spending your time in. Um, you know, work, if you let it, can really start to fill all the space. So by having those boundaries, you can protect your other time. You can protect your relationships and your hobbies and your, you know, physical and mental well-being, which is crucial. And kind of the last tip I want to share related to this today is, you know, if you're working from home most of the time, or, or all the time, as in my case, it's really important uh, to get out of the house sometimes. Um, I think even if you are very introverted, and you're very comfortable being alone all the time, I still think that if you can find places to be alone that are outside of the house, I think mixing that up 
really does wonders for just kind of your, your mental well-being. Uh, you know, we are social creatures kind of um, as, as a general rule of thumb. And so even if you do like to be alone, being alone, but kind of around other people, I think is helpful. And for me, I, I kind of like to have an even split of alone time and social time. Um, oftentimes, I find that going out to a co-working space, even if I don't really talk to anybody, but just being around people really helps energize me. Um, it you know can help me stay more sane throughout my week. Um, it's also a great place to meet people. Uh, I've met a number of awesome developers in the Seattle area. And so now we can get together, meet up, chat organize events and things like that. So it's great um, just to get out and build that network as well. Um, and you know, I, I just think it, it makes for a more productive all around uh, working situation. Um, and one kind of bonus tip for this is if you're feeling a little bit stuck while you're working from home, what you can do is location box something. You say, I'm gonna go to the coffee shop down the street and I'm gonna stay there and work until I finish this. So maybe this is, you know, I'm going to write a blog post. I'm going to write this post until it's done. Or maybe I'm going to fix this one bug. And then when I fix the bug, I'm going to take off and go back home. Or maybe I'm going to switch to a new location. Maybe I'm going to go to the library next um, so that I can get some quiet, focused work done. But switching locations like that can be a really good way to kind of switch things up mentally and almost trick yourself into some extra productivity throughout the day. And then when you get home, you can turn work mode off and be really present for whatever it is that you want to spend your time on. So that's a, you know, a few tips on, you know, balancing, you know, work and life while working remotely. And yeah, sorry, I, I didn't realize I had this uh, helpful little slide here. So yeah, uh, extra little, you know, recap here, you know, carve out some sacred places, you know, an office, a kitchen table or something, and then avoid places like your, your bedroom. Um, keep a dedicated work area if you can, like a desk, you know, like your office. You know, get ready for your day, stick to your routine. Um, and also, I uh, hadn't mentioned this before, but, you know, take advantage of, you know, working remotely or working from home. You know, if you want to walk the dog on lunch, do that. If you need to run an errand in the afternoon because it's the most convenient time to do it or because it helps you maybe avoid traffic, do that. Um, you know, I think it's really crucial if you have a remote team to have flexibility and to really trust your employees and your teammates. And you know, that's something that I will definitely talk about more this year as I'm talking about remote, remote work because I really think that trust um, and valuing output as opposed to time in a chair or an office are, are crucial if you're going to be successful at remote work. So uh, one little extra tip there. Um, sorry I missed that before. Uh, so now, um, like I said, chat Q&A. You know, don't have a ton of people here in the chat uh, which is not unexpected as this was impromptu. Um, for everybody in the chat, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, you know, if you have a question here real quick, uh, throw it in the chat and we can talk about it. Um, give it, you know, 30 seconds here, a minute, maybe something before wrapping this up. Um, but in the future, I, you know, I definitely want to, you know, open this up for Q&A. You know, maybe it's, you know, very specific questions. Maybe it's general questions on, you know, growing in your career, like I said, remote work or, or Android or just anything related to software development. You know, I don't promise to know the answer by any means, but I can very much promise to help in any way that I can and maybe point you to a resource that uh, can better answer the question. And while we're kind of waiting here, I guess, again, you know, I'll just reiterate that I, I really like the idea of the live stream here. Uh, we'll see how this one goes, um, you know, hopefully work through the technical issues, but I really want to do some more of these uh, and be very regular with it. So I'm going to be working to find a time, um, you know, a day, a, a day of the week, a time that works well for me, but also hopefully works well for the community. So if you're watching this, whether live um, or, oh, awesome. Yep. I will, I'll stick around, make sure I get the question there, uh, newbie coats. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, so if you're if you're watching this now or after the fact, um, and you have a you know a time or a week that you think would be fun to have a live stream, uh, let me know. Um, a couple of the ideas that I have is you know like I said this time Friday night I think is kind of cool. Monday morning as well, um, maybe a Saturday morning. 
um, you know, the, the Friday night and Saturday morning are tougher because they're kind of eating into the weekend. So something maybe weekday morning might be end up what we go with, but uh, we're going to see. Okay, let's jump in here and let's say, see the question here. All right, so, so far, Newbie Codes here is asking, you know, new programmers are starting with Kotlin. Uh, yep, absolutely. Uh, but I'm thinking of starting with Java because there's so much more resource out there. Uh, yep, that's definitely true as well. And it will be easier for me to learn. Um, I am learning from home, by the way. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the question here is uh, basically, you know, is it okay to work or is it okay to kind of start learning with Java as opposed to Kotlin? Um, and I'm going to also guess that that is within the context of Android development. Um, although I guess like really this would this would be applicable to kind of any um, any JVM development where you really have uh, Kotlin or Java. So um, I, I think absolutely. You know, if you want to learn Java, I don't think there's any reason not to learn Java. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm actually a really big proponent of trying to, to limit the number of things you're learning at one time. Um, a common, you know, thing I see people struggling with is trying to learn both like Java and Kotlin and, you know, all the other Android libraries all at the same time. And it's really overwhelming to do that. So in this case, like in like Newbie, Code, Newbie Codes asks here, you know, is it, is it okay? Am I doing it right by trying to stick to kind of Java and not also add in Kotlin? Is that okay? Um, absolutely. Uh, newbie codes, I think there's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, and I think it's actually, you know, pretty, pretty smart way of going about it. Uh, because like you said, there are so many resources out there for Java. Like, you know, there's just sort of probably a, a vocal minority and it's maybe it's getting to be less of a minority, but you know, a lot of Kotlin fans like myself that have been doing Kotlin for a long time now and really talking about it quite a bit. Um, and so it can seem like everybody's doing it and you need to jump over to that way. Um, and I think that's gotten even worse since Google announced that they were gonna be Kotlin first. However, um, at the end of the day, we're essentially being hired uh, generally to build successful Android apps, or we are trying to build successful Android apps for ourselves or for clients. And so. Really, at the end of the day, when it gets into the user's hand, the user doesn't care if it's Java or Kotlin. They want to make sure that it's functional. So the biggest, so, oh, excuse me. So the biggest, uh, most important thing that you can do is be able to build a functional quality app, regardless of whatever the tools are. So um, if you are more comfortable right now with Java and you're wanting to focus on just learning Android and learning how to build an app, that is an awesome plan. Um, if you already started with Kotlin and you want to stick with Kotlin, that's an awesome plan too. Um, and the same would go for, you know, frameworks like React Native or Flutter or something like that. Like if you're already kind of invested into a tool, um, they can all at the end of the day build a good product. So you don't have to jump ship. Um, and in particular with the Java and Kotlin um, kind of comparison, I really think it's super easy to get started with Kotlin. So sticking with Java, being comfortable building an app with Java, that's the priority. A absolutely, I think there's nothing wrong with that. And honestly, once you're to that point and you're comfortable, spending a week or two with Kotlin will be enough to make you start to feel proficient. So it's not a big learning pivot down the line to have to add Kotlin into this. So yeah, no worries. Um, you know, Limit what you're working on um, and try and focus on actually being able to build and deliver something and you'll be, you'll be perfect. Thank you for the question very much too. I think that's a that's a good one. Um, I did a video about that, I think last year, like 18 months ago, and we'll probably refresh that again because I do think the situation has changed a bit. Um, and I just think it's something that still gets brought up a lot. So I'm glad that you asked that. Thank you, Newbie Codes. Um, all right, and then uh, Marcos tuning in, he asks, I'm working, oh cool, I didn't realize I could drag this over. That's awesome. Um, so I am working as, a .NET developer remotely, but I want to achieve a remote Android job. I'm learning in my free time, but it's a really big ecosystem. Uh, absolutely. And then kind of the, the follow-up to that is what should I focus on? Yep. Um, 
So to, to summarize this again, uh, Marcos is asking, basically he's a .NET developer working remotely, but wants to uh, kind of move into a remote Android role. So uh, what should what should he focus on, or what should anyone focus on that's in that position? Um, and actually, honestly, pretty similar to what I just talked about with the Kotlin versus Java thing. You know, it, um, we to get a job, we need to be able to demonstrate job-related skills. So if we want to be an app developer for Android, uh, being able to build an Android app is the key skill there. Um, and I don't think that it matters so much what technology you're using to build that. It will, the, the choice in technology will maybe impact what types of jobs you can apply for, but there are jobs out there for everything. I recently wrote a blog post looking at, you know, the jobs out there for like React Native versus Flutter versus, you know, Java and Kotlin native Android. Um, and even like the lowest demand set out there, skill set out there, which I think was Flutter, still had something like 3,000 job listings on LinkedIn. So there's still lots of jobs out there, regardless of kind of technology. So in Marco's case here, uh, where he's a .NET developer, I would suggest um, that in the free time, you start just kind of picking away at one of these technologies. Um, you know, I guess it kind of depends on your your interest in particular, Marcos. You know, if you are more interested in maybe doing uh, cross-platform work, then you could look at like a Flutter or a React Native. Um, you know, the, the job market overall is smaller there, but on the flip side, that means that it's kind of a more specialty skill set. So if you get really proficient, that could be a good way to sort of get your foot in the door um, at one of these places that are investing in those platforms. Um, and on the other side, there's native Android, and that native Android is still so viable. There's so many jobs out there still for native Android. Um, but I think what I would suggest is, regardless of which technology you find yourself more interested in, whether you want to build a cross-platform or more of a single native app, um, pick a small sample project, something that you know is not huge. Like, don't set out to try and rebuild Uber or Instagram um, or even maybe like Twitter but something very focused. And then work on building that thing. Break it down into small tasks at the beginning. Uh, you know, I'm gonna need feature A, B, and C. And then start to chipping away at that. You know, if I need a database, you know, look up Android databases, which will probably lead you to Room. And so then you'll find that skill. Um, and you can kind of break it apart into small things like that. But the reason I talk about finding a, a small focus project is because at the end, if you actually finish the project, you have an awesome portfolio piece. You have something that you can put on your resume, you can share on social media, you can highlight on your GitHub, and recruiters can look at this, but even more importantly, engineers can look at this when they're going through the hiring. And engineers that can look at your code and actually see how you write code, and even better yet, if you can add documentation to your code, if you can add an effective readme, um, it really helps you stand out. So if you can build that app, it automatically shows people that you know how to, you know, complete the job. And in particular, you know, if you're if you're remote and you're in the .NET world right now, you know, if you're trying to get into the Android world, there's maybe not going to be as many people that necessarily, you know, know who you are out there. Oh, I see Marcos and he commented native. So yeah, that simplifies it. So if you're wanting to move into the native world, um, yeah, we'll build a we'll build a native sample project. Um, but like I said, if you, if you have that sample project, it's a good way to sort of help people see your skill set, even if they don't know who you are. Um, or it also helps with the fact that you might not have a really long experience with, you know, native Android development. You know, they'll obviously see your, your .NET background, which definitely will help. And then if you can show that you've been able to transfer that existing .NET experience into being able to say, hey, I built this app, maybe even you ship the app, putting it in the Play Store, I think is a big plus as well and is impressive both to recruiters and engineers. But if you can show that kind of progression of, I started learning this thing, I transferred my skills over, I completed this project, and kind of here is, you know, here's what I did, here are the features I added, um, here's why I made these choices. To me, I think that is a really compelling um, story when I'm hiring someone. Uh, in fact, when I was hiring people at past jobs, that was something that would be really impressive to me. I always enjoyed getting to see people's code 
Um, and if I could then ask them about that code in an interview, it was a win for everybody because I got to get more relevant information. I got to see really that that person knows how to do the job. It's also great for the person being interviewed. If I'm going into an interview, I might be stressed out that they're going to ask me questions I don't know. But if they start asking me about a project that I built, now I'm really comfortable because I know that project. And so now it kind of puts the interview back on your terms, which hopefully makes you more likely to get the job. So to kind of, I guess, summarize that again for Marco's question here, um, you know, if you're trying to kind of get into the Android field, whether it's from a different kind of development background or you're just entering maybe from school um, or just, you know, on your own, maybe you've been coming from a completely different field, uh, being able to demonstrate the skills, I think, is key. So find a small sample project, pick small uh, features one at a time, learn how to implement those. So that might be, you know, database, how to show the UI, uh, how to schedule uh, a repeating task. Um, that I think will help break it down. And at the end, you'll have something awesome to show on your resume uh, and, you know, for your portfolio. Awesome. Yeah, Marcus, uh, I will, I would definitely love to see your application when it's in the store. Um, and also, you know, if, when you get to that point and you're really starting to like look for jobs you want to show off, uh, if you want to, you know, like tweet on social media or anything like that, I love sharing off people's projects, um, you know, and I, I'm not in a position in my current role to really do a lot of hiring, but I do know a lot of people that hire Android developers and I'm always happy to, you know, give a retweet or, uh, you know, try and connect people where I think it makes sense. So yeah, uh, Marco's really uh, good luck with that. I hope that um, that was, was helpful. Uh, and good luck finding an Android job, man. I think that, uh, you know, I, I love it. It's been great for me. Uh, I think it's a fun place to be still. Um, and actually, I'd, I'd be really interested, too, when you get into that, uh, how the .NET experience, um, you know, how that skill set was in trans transferring over. Um, you know, I know C Sharp and Java look pretty similar in many ways, so I'm curious what that transition would be like. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for the questions. That was, that was awesome. This is exactly the kind of thing that I want to do with this live stream. Um, you know, the more questions, the better. If we end up, you know, going long on these, that's totally fine with me because I love helping you all out. Um, and, you know, it gives me great things to think about uh, for future content as well. Um, and just, I, I like being able to help out where I can. So uh, thank you everybody so much. Um, like I mentioned at the very beginning of this, the the last thing I wanna do, oh, and I apparently I didn't add a, a final little slide for this. So we'll exit out of that. But the, the last thing I wanted to do is trying to have some type of a question of the week, something fun um, for us to kind of come back around and maybe chat about. So for for this week, the, the question I wanna throw out to all of you is just what are your big challenges? What are your goals? for 2020. So like in this case, Marcos, I'm guessing maybe your goal is getting it, getting an Android job, breaking into the Android field. Uh, newbie codes, something sounds like yours might be, you know, again, yeah, learning, learning Android, uh, maybe throwing Kotlin in there at some point. Uh, for me, some ideas for maybe, you know, courses or other ways of, you know, helping uh, out everybody, uh, trying to help them reach their goals for, for later this year as well. Um, so that's what's going on for me. Uh, leave a comment down below. What are your goals or what is the big challenge that you're looking to take on in 2020? Um, and let me know if I can help in any way. And with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you so much to everybody that tuned in. Uh, that's awesome. It means a lot to me. I know this was very impromptu and random in the future. Hopefully those will be scheduled much further in advance so that we have more notice. And I, I hope to, to see you all again soon. Have a, a great weekend, a great day, night, whenever you're watching this. And I will catch you all in the next video. Until next time, devs.